there is sin in all of our lives, and there'll always be sin in our lives until Christ returns and makes everything right, makes everything perfect. So therefore then, uh, how can we ever help anybody? How can we ever help anybody with their sin? How can we ever show anyone their sin if none of us are perfect, if there's always sin in our lives? Well, that's a great question to ask. That's a great question to ask, and you're absolutely right. None of us are perfect. But in this passage, in the whole Bible, Jesus is never asking for perfection. He's asking for progress. If you spend uh, any amount of time on social media, uh, you will come across uh, something called progress, progress pictures, progress pictures. And, and what you usually find is it's usually a friend or someone who you know who was one time incredibly unfit and probably very, very fat. And they put up a picture of what they were like back then when they were unfit and overweight. But then next to it, they put a picture of where they are now. And after lots of hard work, they are now thin and fit and active and healthier. And so they are showing you the progress which they have made through the pictures which they show. And the reason that they put these up uh, is yes, to show everyone all of the hard work which they have um, put in, but it's also to encourage you that if they can, then you can also. And so you often see those on social media. And this morning in Luke chapter 6, verse 39 to 45, Jesus gives us three pictures to encourage us to make progress in our Christian life. Three pictures uh, so that we can make progress in our Christian life. And these pictures come in the form of parables. And parables you'll find throughout Jesus' ministry. He uses parables a lot. And all parables are, are a simple story or picture communicating a profound spiritual truth. A simple story or picture communicating a profound spiritual truth. And parables will often involve warning, challenges, advice, and encouragement. And we find all of those things in the three progress pictures Jesus sets before our eyes and ears this morning. So are you ready? to make progress this morning. Yes? Amen? Good, I am. The first progress picture we find this morning is in verses 39 to 40. We just heard this read. So let's read it again. Jesus says, Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. In this picture, in this parable, Jesus is warning his followers about who they follow. Warning his followers about who they follow and specifically uh, that they should not follow the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were the religious um, teachers, the religious leaders in those ancient Jewish um, times. And Jesus is warning his followers to not follow them because they're blind. We know Jesus is speaking about them because in Matthew 23, he speaks to the Pharisees and he calls them blind. You are leaders who are blind. You are fools who are blind, he says, right to their face. And Jesus, in this first picture, is saying, if you follow a blind leader, then you are just as blind as they are. If you follow a blind leader, then you are just as blind as they are. Now, Jesus knows. Jesus knows every single one of us in this room needs somebody to follow, somebody to learn from, somebody to lead us. That's that's how all of us learn. That's how all of us make progress in life, by following someone else's example by learning from the things which they say, from being led by them in how they live. We all need somebody to follow. But Jesus also knows that you become 
like the person you follow. And so if you follow the wrong leader, you become the wrong kind of person, and he adds, you end up in the wrong kind of place. If you follow the wrong leader, you become the wrong kind of person, and you end up in the wrong kind of place. This is why he says, don't follow the Pharisees, or otherwise you'll become like a Pharisee and end up in a a pit, which is a picture for hell. You follow a Pharisee, you become like a Pharisee, and you end up in hell. You become the wrong kind of person, you end up in the wrong kind of place. You can't make progress by following a blind man. They don't know where they're heading. Instead, you need to follow somebody who can see. You need to follow somebody who can see. But not just someone who can see as much as you can. Then you won't make any progress. You'll just stay where you are. You won't end up anyway. You can only see as much as each other. No, 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 no. No, you need to follow someone who can see more than you can. You need to follow someone who can see more than you can. If you want to get further forward, then you need to follow someone who's already further forward. You need to be led by someone who is further in front than you are. If you want to make progress in the Christian life, you need to follow somebody who is further forward in their progress in the Christian life. You don't want to follow someone who's blind, and you don't want to follow someone who can see only as much as you can. You want to follow someone who's further forward. You you want to follow someone who's already been through the hardships and the struggles that the Christian life brings, because that's going to save you a lot of pain, because they can help you to navigate be led through the hardships and the struggles that the Christian life brings. You want to follow someone who's further ahead than you. If you're led by the blind, you may as well be blind. But if you are led by someone who sees more than you, then you will see more than you already do. So, who should we follow? If we can't follow the Pharisees, then who should we follow? Well, obviously the answer is Jesus. Follow Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's standing in um, up in front of hundreds and thousands of people, and he's setting himself over and against these religious leaders. And he's saying, don't follow them. They're blind. They say that they know God, but they have no experience of God. Follow me. I am God. I know God. I've experienced God. I am the God who sees. Follow me. And this makes complete sense, right? When a child wants to become a sports, a a star, uh, uh, or do they or do they learn uh, from those sports athletes who are just kind of average, uh, kind of always at the back? No, absolutely not. They go online and they watch every sporting event. They watch every interview they can find of the best sports athlete in the world, the best of the best. Even a child knows that if they want to make progress, if they want to become the best in the world, then they need to learn from the best in the world. Even a child knows that. And so if you want to live the best Christian life you can live, then you need to follow the best. And that's Jesus himself. That's Jesus himself. And this is driven even further home. This is driven even further home when we understand what our purpose in life is. All of us have a purpose in life. All of us have various paths to walk. We have different families to have. Some of us will get married. Some of us won't. Some of us will work here. Some of us will work there. We all have different paths to walk, but our Our destination is the same. Our overall purpose is the same. And we find out what that purpose is for every single one of us in Romans 8, 28 to 29, where the Apostle Paul says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. What is that purpose? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, he chose before time for this purpose, to be conformed 
to the image of his son. This is your purpose. In your workplace, in your family, in your singleness, in your parenting, uh, in your church, this is your purpose to become like Jesus, to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's your purpose, to live a life of love, a life of joy and peace, a life of power and impact and uniqueness, a life of humility and glory. That is your purpose, to live like and become like Jesus. And so if you want to live a fruitful and a faithful and a successful Christian life, you need to set your ears and your eyes to heaven on Jesus. To Jesus. That's who we should follow. That's who we should learn from. But what does that practically look like as a Christian? Does that mean that I shouldn't go to church anymore? I shouldn't listen to any teachers or pastors? I should just read and pray and just hope that I hear from from Jesus and I know exactly how to live? Is that what it means? I should just go this Christian life alone following Christ? No, absolutely not. It does not mean that. No, absolutely not. Because what we find in Ephesians chapter 4 is that Jesus has given us pastors and teachers to help us to follow Jesus Christ, to help us to be led by him. This is what it says in Ephesians 4. And he, Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints, that's us, that's you, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then next, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, who into Christ. Have you just caught what Paul is saying? He's saying, your purpose is to grow up into Christ to be mature, no longer be children, tossed to and fro with this and that and learning this and hearing that. No, 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 but to grow up into mature manhood, into the image of Christ. And one of the primary ways Jesus has given to us to make that happen is apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Yeah, but we have a problem, haven't we? Because there's lots of people out there who call themselves pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets. And some of them, I don't think, say things that are very helpful. So how do we know which pastors, which teachers, which mentors we should have in our life that we should learn from and follow? Well, I'm glad that you asked that because the Apostle Paul, again, hands us such a helpful piece of advice on this in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 where he says be imitators of me as I am of Christ now simply what Paul is saying there is I am not Jesus but there are some parts of me which are like him those parts of me follow those learn from those Those teachings I give, which honor him, which glorify him, follow those, learn from those. I am not like Christ, but as much of me that is imitating him, follow that, learn from that. That's what Paul is saying. So, which pastors, which teachers, which mentors should we choose to follow, to learn from, so that we can grow up into the image of Christ? We should choose those who point more to Jesus than to themselves. We should choose those who point more to the words of Jesus than to their own thoughts. We should choose those who live more like Christ 
than live like the world. We should choose those who are constantly saying in their actions and their words, not to us, not to us, but to Jesus be the glory. We need to choose those who are further ahead with Christ than we are. Because then we will get further ahead with Christ than where we are. We need to choose those, not just who can see, but can who, but can, but those who can see more of Jesus than we can. We need to choose those who love Christ, teach Christ, preach Christ, and point you constantly back, not to yourself, not to them, but to Christ. Because that's our purpose, to become like. So the first progress picture Jesus shows us this morning is to make sure those who lead you see more than you. Make sure those who lead you see more than you. But it's not the only picture he shows us this morning to help us progress. The next one is found in verses 41 to 42. 41 to 42. Where Jesus says, these famous words, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out that speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, when we hear that, we don't react that much. But 2,000 years ago, for those who originally heard these words, they would have burst out laughing. They would have laughed their heads off. Because what an absurd picture this is of a surgeon, a surgeon who goes to practice surgery on a person's eye, which has just got a little speck in it, and yet that surgeon themselves can't see because there's a gigantic log hanging out of his. It's just an absolute absurd picture, a ridiculous picture, and yet Jesus says, that's you. That's me. When we attempt to correct others of their sin while there is a glaring sin in our own lives. That's us. We're that ridiculous picture, that absurd surgeon who attempts to correct sin in other people's lives while there is a glaring and obvious sin in yours. And and it may not be glaring and obvious to us. You may have done a very fantastic job at hiding it. We don't see it, but he does. And you do. It is glaring and it is obvious in your life. And because God sees it, can you just imagine what he's thinking? When he sees you attempting to perform spiritual surgery on somebody while there's a gigantic sin in your life. Can you imagine how foolish that we look? How arrogant, how proud we are. Trying to commit surgery on someone else when we need it ourselves. We see this all the time in our lives. Her marriages especially. I know not everyone in here is married, but I don't want you to feel uh, left out. Everything I'm going to say is applicable to you also in your workplace, with your family, in your singleness. But marriages especially, we see this. You've got husbands expecting their wives to respect them while they are ungentle, ungracious, impatient, unkind to the one who they claim to love. You've got husbands ordering their wives to recognize them as the head of the household, to submit to their authority. All the while, the wife, she goes off to bed and the husband, he goes off on his laptop and watches pornography. And yet still, he expects the respect. Do you seriously think, men, that the Apostle Paul, when he said those words of husbands, love your wife as Christ loves his church, he seriously thought the way you're acting, the way you are living is exactly what he had in mind. No, absolutely not. Christ doesn't treat us like that. Christ doesn't love us like that. So why do we love our wives like that? 
How arrogant can we be to think that our own sin, our glaring sin, is worthy of ignoring just so we can go and tell her what's wrong in her life. It's pathetic. And it's evil. And it's wrong. But marriages don't just involve husbands. There's also a woman in there. And wives. You're expecting your husband to love you with this unceasing love. And then you just, you speak to him with such attitude and sass. And you're rude. And you, and, and you make him feel so small with the words that you say. And then you speak badly about him to his children, uh, to your family, to your friends. And then yet you still claim he should love me anyway. Because, 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 pastor, it's just who I am. That sass. The attitude is just my personality. Let me tell you, sister, a personality trait is never an excuse for sin. God transforms people. And that transforming power isn't just for your husband, it's also for you. There are countless of us in this room who are attempting to take specks out of others' lives while there are logs hanging out of us. And we can say, and we do this, not just with husbands and wives, but with friends and parents and family members and children even, and politicians and those who, who, who hurt us, those who upset us, those who frustrate us in, in any form, small or big. We do this all the time. We justify it and we say, well, it's their fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. She said this. He said that. They said that. And you're probably right. You're probably right. But in Scripture, it says that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when we do, we will answer for our actions. Answer for our works. Not for hers. Not for his. Not for theirs, but for yours. And so we need to begin now. So let me hand you a piece of advice based on what Jesus is saying here. It's this. Before you help others to work on their lives, work on yours. Before you help others to work on their lives, work on yours. Don't even think about them until you've come clean with Christ about you. Don't even think about picking out specs until you chop down logs. Before you help others work on their lives, work on yours. We cannot let Satan win. This is how he comes in in our friendships, and our families, in our churches. This is what he does. This is what he does. He hides your log. He helps you to hide your log. And he highlights the specs. But our purpose in life, isn't it, is to become like Jesus. So can you imagine what a difference it would make in our marriages, in our homes, in our churches, in our workplaces, if we were living like Jesus, if Christ was present in us, in our lives? Can you imagine the difference it would make? I'll tell you. Because where Christ is present, evil is driven out. Where Christ is present, goodness is attracted. Where Christ is present, lives are transformed. So if you are pursuing to live like Christ in your marriage, in your home, in your friendships, in your workplace, in your church, and stop telling everyone else to live like him, if you were living like him, evil would be driven out. Goodness would be attracted. Lives would be transformed. Maybe it'll take time, but it will happen. It will happen. Because where the presence of Christ is, change happens. But hang on. Because this is all well and good, but none of us are perfect. Amen? There is sin in all of our lives, and there'll always be sin in our lives until Christ returns and makes everything right, makes everything perfect. So therefore then, uh, how can we ever help anybody? How can we ever help anybody with their sin? How can we ever show anyone their sin? 
if none of us are perfect, if there's always sin in our lives? Well, that's a great question to ask. That's a great question to ask, and you're absolutely right. None of us are perfect. But in this passage, in the whole Bible, Jesus is never asking for perfection. He's asking for progress in this life. He's asking for progress. And holding on to a glaring sin in your life that you can see, that God can see, is not progress. If anything, it makes you regress. It takes you further away from God's presence, from God's purpose for you. It takes you further away from who you were made and saved to be. Holding on to a log weighs you down. It doesn't cause progress, it causes regress. And so what Jesus is saying here is to make progress. He's not saying to be perfect, but he is saying to get rid of the logs, get rid of the glaring sins. How David, the king of Israel, was in a position just like this. Many of you will know about him. David used his authority to sleep with another man's wife and then to murder that man. This was a glaring sin in his life. And, and this king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, held on to that sin for a year. He didn't confess it. He didn't repent of it. He hid it away and he held on to it. And in that year, he still went to church. He still wrote psalms. He still prayed. He still worshipped. He still was a husband and a father. He did everything just as he always would while holding on to this glaring sin, which is, which, is, which is terrifying and telling, isn't it, for some of us? That we might not see it, but you do and God sees it. And for David, he saw it, but he held on to it, but God saw it. And David would not bring it to the Lord in private. So God did what he does when someone does not bring their sin in in private. God brought it out in public. For what is kept in the dark will always be brought out in the light. And Nathan, the prophet of Israel, received this, this message, this revelation from the Lord at what his king had done was holding on to this past year. So Nathan was sent to him. Nathan brought David a test. And he told him a story about a man who committed a crime where a sheep was stolen. And and David was infuriated at this crime, couldn't believe what this man had done. And he said, this man should be executed believer with the log in his eye he still thought he was just and right to correct others of their sin while he was holding on to his can you believe that well david says this man should be executed and nathan then said you are the man you are the man and david was shocked shocked But the sin he'd been holding on to, the sin he'd been hiding, the sin that he just made part of his life had now come out into the light. No no longer could he hold it in private. Now it was brought out in public. And he was the man. He had nowhere else to run. So he ran to God. The place he should have run at first. The place he should have run before any of this even happened. And he runs to God and he does what he should have always done. He prays. And he confesses to God. And we are privileged enough to read that prayer. We can hear that prayer of what the king of Israel prayed as he repented and confessed of his sin. And in Psalm 51, this is what he says. He says, oh God, hide your face from my sins. He's so horrified at his own sin. He now can't even bear the thought of God seeing it. When for a year he was fine. Oh, but now it's come to the light. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. How many of you need to pray that prayer? And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Or David knows that could happen. A Saul, who was the king of Israel before he was, had also sinned. 
and he showed sadness for it. He had admitted his sin, but he just carried on in it. He didn't truly repent and confess his sin, and God took away his presence from him. Saul, who once prophesied to Israel, then had nothing. And so David says, please don't let that happen to me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. But instead, O oh God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit, a spirit that wants you. And then he says, next. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Then and only then. Who knows? How long David would have held on to this sin in private? Well, it doesn't matter. It was too long. God had enough. So he brought it out in public. He brought it out in public. David had nowhere to run. And do you see what he's saying? That he finally realizes the seriousness of his sin. His eyes are opened. And so he, he confesses it. I've done it. I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. Now cleanse me. Restore me. And he says, and then I can teach. Then I can show respect. Now, David is not perfect after this, far from it. But the glaring sin in his life is finally taken out. And it's only then that he can help others. None of us are perfect. But the glaring sin needs to be taken out before you can help others. So you need to shape up and shut up before you help others to become like Christ. God wants to change every single one of us. He wants us to grow in him. God wants to pour his grace out on you, and grace is transforming. God loves you. God loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. And we know from this morning that there's lots of husbands and wives in this room who need to hear this and act on this seriously. It's gone on too long. It's gone on too long. And so, before you work on others, work on yourself. Now, my worry this morning is that if we just ended there, we could become quite focused on just uh, fixing behavioral issues in our lives. And the problem when you become focused on fixing behavioral issues in your life is that you end up just swapping one log out for another log. You see this every time. Uh, when somebody comes off of... Um, Drugs, they then just swap out drugs and then they become obsessed with food or drink or something else. People, when they only focus on the outward behavioral issues, will so often just take out one log and put in another log. We don't want to do that this morning. No, no, we want to get to the root of the issue. And that's exactly what Jesus does next in the third picture of progress. He gets to the root of the issue. So far, Jesus has been focusing on the fruitfulness of our lives the quality of our progress, how we live, how we think, who we follow, who we learn from, how we speak, what we speak about. He's focused on the outward fruit. But what we're about to learn is that good fruit is determined by having a good root. Our fruit is determined by our root. This is what he says in verses 43 to 45, the last section of our passage. He says, for no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. You are known by your fruit. For figs are not, are not, are not gathered into thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked up from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of their heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. Jesus gives this picture and then he explains it. He says that the fruit is your life. How you think, how you act, how you treat others, how you speak, what you speak about, how you use your time. That's your fruit, your life. The tree is you. It's you, your person, who you are. And he says that what kind of person you are defines what kind of life that you will live. And he says then that what kind of person you are is defined by what is in your heart. 
what you treasure most, what you love most. You could call that your roots, your roots. And so simply Jesus is saying, your fruit is determined by your root. Example, if you have bad roots, you will have bad fruits. If you have bad heart, treasuring the wrong things, loving the wrong things, when then your life will live in the wrong way. And shallow roots, a shallow life. But if your roots are good, then your life, your fruit will be good. If you're treasuring, loving the right things, then your life will be lived in the right way. Your legacy will be left in the right way. Your roots determine your fruit. And your fruit proves your root. And some of you will hear that and think, okay, well, if my fruit proves my root, then I can just say the right things. I can just act in the right way and do the right stuff. And then people won't think that I'm a bad person. But then in private, then I can go and enjoy and live the way that I want to, as long as I say the right stuff in front of the right people and live the right way at the right times. Or you could try. But Jesus then says, eventually, we'll all see it. Because he says, out of the overflow, whatever's in your heart will eventually overflow. And out of your mouth, we'll hear what's really in your heart. Out of your life, we'll see what's really in your heart. It will eventually be seen. You can run but you can't hide, is what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And so so in essence, Jesus is saying, I can look at your life and know what you love. I can look at how you act on the outside and know what's on the inside. And we can. All of us can. We see it. We know. We know what someone's truly like on the inside based on how they speak with us, how they act with us. We see it. We all see it. And that's what Jesus is saying. I see what's on the inside based on what you're doing on the outside. Now, now this fact is incredibly encouraging to some of us. If you're someone who is attempting to treasure Christ in your heart, if you are attempting to love him above all else, then you're like, yes, thankfully this promise, ugh, my life will be transformed. My life will change and people will see it. Praise God, if I keep on treasuring treasuring the Lord, then my life will show it. It might not feel like it now, but it will. That's what God promises. But then for others of you who are not treasuring Christ, this is terrifying, isn't it? This is terrifying. If Jesus is taking a, a back seat in your life, it's not that you don't love him anymore but you don't love him as your first love anymore. He's just taken a back seat. Well, well, if that's the case in your life, then this must be terrifying because we'll all see it eventually, even if those closest to you aren't already seeing it now. And you might think, okay, well, that isn't any big issue for me, Pastor. If you see it or if anyone else sees it, I'll move. I'll find other friends. Okay, perhaps, but he sees it, and he's already seen it, and you know it, and you need to repent. To repent means to change your mind. You need to change your mind on the way you are living, on the way you're acting, who you are with, who you aren't with. You need to repent. You need to humble yourself. You need to stop holding on to that pride. You need to stop uh, seeking the pleasures of this world, thinking that they'll satisfy you. Surely you've been alive long enough to know that's not the case. You need to stop letting Satan influence you. You need to stop. You need to, or you need to stop with these stupid excuses you keep on bringing. And you need to be like the king of Israel and fall to your knees and say, God, Blot out my iniquity. Lord, cleanse my heart. I can't live like this anymore. I've made a mess of it. 
but I'm coming back to the heart of worship. That's what you need to be saying. That's what you need to be doing. You need to return to your first love. That's what Revelation 3 says. You need to return to your first love. And isn't that what a Christian is? Someone who loves everyone, who loves many things, but at the top of their list is Jesus. He's the first love. Isn't that what a Christian is? And that's what you need to do. Some of you put Jesus second, third, and fourth, and we're going to see it. And he already sees it. You need to return to your first love. And isn't that wonderful? Because you love Christ because he first loved you. And he still does. Whatever's happened, whatever situation that you're in, whatever log the Lord is highlighting to you right now, he still loves you. While you were a sinner, Christ died for you. That hasn't changed. He loves you and he wants to see you progress from this. He wants to see you transformed out of this. He loves you so much that right now, He's standing outside of your heart, the entranceway of your heart, and he's knocking on the door of your heart this morning, just waiting for you to open it. Not to scold you, not to take you out and throw you away. No, no, no. He's knocking on the door of your heart, waiting for you to open it so he can come in and sit with you. And bring you joy and bring you cleansing and bring you peace and progress. Jesus loves you as you are, but too much to leave you as you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that begins today. Don't wait till Monday. Don't wait till next week. Do it today. Do it today. And some of you will need to come this morning to the Lord with open hands. Some of you will need to come this morning down to the front on your knees and just say, Lord, in front of everyone, I'm making this stand. I can't treat my wife like that anymore. I can't treat my husband like that anymore. Even if he is an absolute scumbag, I will not be. It's reality, isn't it? Lord, I need you to take this log out of my eye. You need to come to the altar as a living sacrifice. Laying before God everything so that he may transform you and conform you to the image of his son. That begins today. The moment is today. Become a tree that enjoys the photosynthesis of heaven. Where you just stand there and receive the refreshing rains of God's presence. Where you stand there and just enjoy the radiance of the glory of the son of heaven. What kind of tree will you be? What progress will you make this morning? Well, it begins not with changing behavior, but with changing your treasure and putting Christ in the rightful place he belongs in your heart. Now, before we close, I haven't made something clear this morning. Jesus is preaching this sermon to those who follow him, those who believe in him. And that means, therefore, that however much you have been moved or touched with what I've said this morning, you can experience none of it if you're not a Christian. Why? Well, because Christians have received a new life. They have received a new heart, a new mind, so they can now uh, understand things and receive things from God, which no one else can. And that happens when somebody is born again. That's the words which Jesus uses, he says, to receive this new life, your sins be taken away, to make progress and live your purpose, you need to be born again. If you're not born again, you will not go to heaven, he says. You will not be saved from hell, he says. You will not know the forgiveness of sins. Your life will not be transformed. You will not live your purpose. You will not be right with God and part of his family if you're not born again. So what does that mean? Well, we're all born once naturally. God says we need to be born a second time spiritually by God himself. How does that happen? I'll tell you. It's as easy as ABC. Do you want to be born again this morning? And let me tell you something. Even if you are born again this morning, if God has spoken to you this morning and you need to come to him in confession and cleansing and help, then this is also a good way to make that happen. A, B, C. You need to admit it. Admit that you are a sinner, that you have done wrong. You haven't lived your life as God has made you to live, that you are broken and you cannot fix 
or yourself, but you need a Savior. And so you admit that and then you believe. You believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You believe that he is God and the Son of God. You believe that he came to earth 2,000 years ago, lived a life we could not live, perfect for us. And then he died a death we should have died on a cross, taking our punishment in our place, taking our sins. And then three days later, he rose again from the dead. Believe that. Believe that. Admit, believe, and then commit. Commit to not being in charge of your life anymore. But now Jesus is in charge of your life. He is your Lord. He is your master. If you A, B, and C, you will be born again. And for those of you who are, if you A, B, and C, you will be cleansed. And you will make progress. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer now. And if you want to become a Christian this morning, if you want to be born again, then I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to pray it in your head, and I want you to mean it in your heart. And if you mean it in your heart, pray it in your head, you will be born again. And those of you who are and want to be cleansed, I think it would be good for you to also pray this prayer, to recommit yourself to the Lord. So why don't we pray? Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, past, present, and future. You took my shame, and you were killed for it. I believe, Jesus, that you faced hell for me, so I would not have to. And I believe, Jesus, that you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven and a purpose on earth and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. I turn from my sin to be cleansed again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is now my home. In Jesus' name, the church said, Amen.